and we have a video link with Professor Agarwal that will be here shortly as well, so keep your eyes peeled to the right. Um, just a quick overview of what we're going to be discussing, and then I'll turn it over to the panelists, and then we will be taking your questions from the audience and on Twitter. Uh, so just a bit of background. I only have about a minute to, to chat here. Global education is at a crisis point. 61 million children are out of primary school and 71 million young people, including half of all adolescents in low-income countries, receive no post-primary education. 793 million adults are illiterate. Youth unemployment continues to grow, yet one-third of companies around the world report failing to fill positions due to talent shortage. However, new technologies and innovative partnerships between the public and private sector provide unprecedented opportunities to address these issues. So how can we bring education to the masses by leveraging technology? What are the current trends that we should all know about? That's our goal for today's panel. I hope that the audience can take away two things at the end of this panel discussion. First, a better understanding of the current trends in ed tech, and second, new insight into how public and private companies are tackling the world of education. To help us do that, we have a panel of experts from around the world. I'm pleased to welcome them all to the Global Education and Skills Forum today. I'd like to quickly introduce each panelist who will then speak for just a few minutes, and then uh, we'll have an informal question and answer period where I encourage the audience to ask questions of our panelists. And just like in the classroom, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. And when I call on you, please state your name, where you're from, and then proceed with your question. And of course, let's keep the questions directed up to education technology questions. Uh, so let's see if the video link works over here. And I'll do a little introduction while we wait. Joining us from the US through What Else Technology, Professor Anad Agarwal is the president of edX in the USA. edX is a worldwide online learning initiative of MIT and Harvard University. He's a professor in MIT's EECS department. He's also served as the director of computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory. Professor should be up on the video shortly. Okay. All right, we temporarily lost that signal, the beauty of technology as we all know and love it. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna move on to the next one and come back, I promise. Uh, we'll start then with Hervé Marche, who is the Chief Technology Officer of GEMS Education UAE. Hervé is the group uh, CTO at GEMS. He's an international figure in application of technology for better learning outcomes and a recognized visionary in the field. He held an executive leadership position for 12 years at Apple, where he led sales and marketing activities, as well as the business development of the EMEIA the Education Marketplace, a one and a half billion dollar business unit. During his time at Apple, the education department became number one in Europe, multiplying by five its market share. So thanks again for joining us, and you can take it away. Okay, uh, do we have any video now? We'll do you first. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. Thank you. So many things have been you know, said today, but uh, it's really difficult not to say again what was really uh, very well announced. However, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a weather thinker, and even if I'm uh, on the technology side, I believe that technology is not what matters. What really matters is education. And uh, we have seen, you know, in some of these countries, and I will do the comparison with uh, the movie, the Disney movie Fantasia, that we have lots of technology sometimes that are put in a classroom and nothing is happening. And we talk a lot uh, with some of your invitees uh, about the digital divide. What I think is that we need to differentiate what is a commodity and what is technology. And I, I used to hear uh, when I was in the other company that technology is technology to the people that were born before the technology. And that for a lot of kids, it's not about technology, it's about how to learn. And then we certainly need to change uh, the way we teach. And definitely here, what I see is that whatever is a technology, whatever is a smartphone for me is a commodity, but what you put in terms of knowledge on the smartphone, the way you're going to engage with the kids on the smartphone is certainly enough. If you can afford to have access, broadband, videos, lectures, it's even fantastic. But I think that a lot of people put a mental, mental barrier, sorry, to say my technology is not good enough, so I'm not going to use technology. 
And I think the point is that at a certain area, if someone's area using it, and ready and get with it and make and sure that everybody is going to share. Sure so what I will say very briefly so is that we have seen, we'll seen a lot of best practice. What, what we need to do now is to go to a scalable and sustainable model, making sure that every kid can access. And all of this content has been created to be available uh, everywhere uh, on the planet. And that's the mission of the technology, to serve the needs not to be the first to say here what you need to do. Educationalists need to tell here what we want to achieve and technologists versus <coughs> what is available at the place they are need to bring the available technology to serve this purpose. <coughs> so it's what I will say really very briefly. I think that it's a fantastic tool to facilitate, to accelerate. Pardon? I'm not a fan of the engagement because definitely I think that the it's engagement uh, is a, a different matter. The engagement was uh, somebody talked about the tool this morning, about the parent, uh, about the teacher, and uh, some uh, Sean Hill was, uh, from Scootboo was telling us that very often the competition in some of very, uh, what they call advanced countries, the video game, so how do we compete the time for the kids. So I think the engagement, we should not use technology to engage the kids. We need to use technology because it's a, a media that something that can help to go faster. It's a mental bicycle and you can just learn faster, uh, but you can also address more kids. And one of the examples that I like is that with technology, instead of having one teacher for 25 kids, you can have 25 teachers building for one kid and then it done and go for the other kids. So it's what I wanted to share before uh, any question to this. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, we're now going to move over to the video screen on your right, and we're going to chat with Professor Agarwal. Professor, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you could just introduce yourself and share a few words, that would be great. Sure. So my name is, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. So my name is uh, Anand Agarwal. I am the uh, president of uh, edX. And uh, I'm also a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. So in terms of, uh, as, we look, as we look at technology and see how technology applies to a number of fields, to really cast into question, you know, how we've done with education, I'd like you to think about any field. You know, take healthcare, for example. In healthcare, if you look at the revolutions that have happened in the past few centuries, you know, just think about technology applied to radiography, to x-ray tomography, uh, applied to things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, applying antibiotics in a way that distills them in, in a way that gives it to humans in a titrated manner. So uh, a number of innovations in healthcare over the past several hundred years that have completely transformed healthcare. Similarly, technology, and innovations in uh, transportation. Okay, we invented the rocket engine. We invented uh, inertial navigation systems. And the list goes on and on. But now I'd like you to think about education. If you think back 400 years, you know, think about what have been the big innovations in education. Honestly, I can't think of any huge innovations in education since the printing press, which was 500 years ago. So why is it that despite the fact that we have huge research institutions where education is part and parcel of our mission, we really haven't innovated hugely in education. Now, online technology is such a revolution. I really believe that applying technology to education to create online learning is really the biggest revolution in education since the printing press. We can do, we can, as education, both on our campuses and worldwide. And it is an absolutely perfect for our millennial uh, generation of students. Now take for example, I have, I have two children, a 13 year old and an 18 year old. Now just to give you a sense of how well matched online technology is to our children, um, I'm sure all of you have stories of your own children. Uh, when my son turned 13, you know, they suddenly stopped speaking English a new language called Keenlish. 
Perceival is to have two sounds, a grunt and a silent. And then I discovered that really the only way to communicate with our children once they become teenagers is through texting. This was a huge epiphany for me. You text them, you get an instant response, but you talk to them, you know, you get uh, teamless. So think of this context in which we are creating this online technology that is an absolutely perfect match for our millennial generation. So edX was created within this context. So edX.org is an online portal where we are offering free education to people around the world. And we're also looking to reimagine our own campuses. So edX was founded by Harvard and MIT with a contribution of uh, $50 million total. It's a nonprofit. Our platform was proposed. We started the open source process a couple of days ago. And the main idea of edX is to dramatically increase access to education for students around the world. And to give you a sense of what is possible, when we launched our first course, it was a hard course uh, in circuit electronics about a year ago with very little marketing dollars. And this was completely uh, through social networking, the word spread. And before we knew it, we had 155,000 students from around the world, from 162 countries, taking this hard circuit and electronics course. Of this, 7,200 students passed the course. But look at these numbers, 155,000 is bigger than the total number of alumni out of MIT in its 150 year history. So numbers are simply, simply staggering. Our mission is also to reimagine campus education. How do we rethink our campuses? How do we bring technology into campus and uh, schools and universities and really reimagine how we apply technology? So let me speak a couple of words about how so with online learning, as we apply technology to education, we replace the lectures with what we call learning sequences. So I, you know, I encourage you to go on to edX.org and sign up for a course. So for example, um, a couple of new courses were launched two days ago, one on uh, Greek history from Harvard and one on copyright, uh, one on justice from Harvard as well by Mike Sandel. So in these courses, we replace the lecture with what we call video sequences. A learning sequence has a sequence of video, each of them about five to 10 minutes long, interleaved with interaction, with interactive exercise. So students are interacting with videos, they're doing exercises, getting instant feedback, where the computer is grading all the exercises and not human beings. There's also a discussion forum. The community aspect of learning is really big. In our classroom, we spent, we spent all our time fighting Facebook and fighting interactivity and fighting connected students. But online, with online learning, we bring the discussion forum into our platform and there students interact with each other, ask questions of each other. And really, that's what enables us to scale to lots of students. When students ask a question and you have 100,000 students in your class, what that students are answering each other's questions and as instructors, we don't have to go and do that ourselves. So students teach and they learn as they teach. This can come back to campus and help us as well. So how does technology apply to on-campus use? I'll give you one example. So uh, we took one of our courses, the same circuits course, and we licensed it to San Jose State University in Silicon Valley, California. So there they use what is called a blended model, a flipped class. You'll hear blended classes, flipped classes a lot. And so there the students watch the online videos and interactive exercises in the dorm room. Then they would come to class and have some in-person activity with the professor. They would have one-on-one -on -one interaction with the professor, ask questions, professor would answer the question, and then they would break up into small groups of uh, two and three and uh, solve problems and discuss amongst themselves. So this blended model was extraordinarily successful and I'll share some preliminary uh, data with you. Traditionally for that course at San Jose State, the retake rate for the course, believe it or not, was 41%. In other words, 41 out of every 100 students would have to retake the course. They would not pass the course. But with the edX class, with the blend of online learning and in-person technology, the pass rate went dramatically up. 
and only nine students out of 100 had to retake the course. So the result, 41% failure rate, it fell down to 9%. So we can really improve learning outcomes by engaging the students in a much better manner than we have been able to uh, in the past. And the technology and the, and the opportunities through technology are absolutely boundless. So people have said, you know, online learning is a challenge for education. Just as online learning was a challenge to uh, newsprint and, and other fields, I don't view it as a challenge. I view this as our single biggest opportunity. For the first time, teachers are becoming rock stars. For the first time, venture capitalists are putting big money into education. I'll give you the kind of things we can do with technology. People say, how do you do interactive, how do you do labs? Well, you go to edx.org, we do interactive laboratories. We have a virtual lab. We have a virtual lab for circuits where students can construct designs in Lego-like manner and completely analyze them by computer. In Eric Lander's biology course launched last week, um, I encourage you to go check it out. There is a molecular builder where students can build molecules. In fact, I believe that online, we can make the experience, in some cases, better than real life. You know, how do you have students build a molecule in real life, in a real class? You can't do that. But online, you can have students construct these gene sequences and molecules and do some very exciting stuff. We can also do humanities very successfully. In a normal class, grading an essay might take uh, a teacher multiple hours. But online, we use technologies like peer grading and AI assessment, which can enable computers to grade even essays and free from answers really, really quickly and efficiently. So uh, let, me, let me pause with that, just to say that online technology is a real revolution, and I think we have an opportunity here to really seize this opportunity and completely revolutionize <coughs> education as we know it. Thank you very much. Um, teachers as rock stars, I love that. Uh, okay, so next up on our panel is Kevin Dunfeef, Director of Global Education for Cisco. Uh, he works for Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Russia, and develops strategies for engagement with ministries and other governmental agencies responsible for education, as well as with educational institutions, both public and private. Uh, thanks for coming, Kevin, and take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Professor Agawa has provided me with a very nice segue into what I want to talk about this, this afternoon. Uh, he mentioned the word revolution. And it reminds me of the work by Thomas Kuhn, published in 1962, I think, which talks about the structure of scientific revolutions. And Kuhn was interested in the way in which change occurs. I began my teaching career before I joined Cisco in 1970, rather a long time ago, uh, in Rwanda, in Central Africa. And I was armed then with just a piece of chalk, and I had a blackboard. Um, that was normal. That was the way that education was delivered at that time in many parts of the world, actually. I believe that my father probably learned in the same way and my grandfather too. So nothing much changed really in all of that time. Change was incremental. Uh, some of you may remember going from a blackboard to a green board. And then later when you were very progressive, of course, you went from the green board to the white board. And instead of having a piece of chalk and having chalk dust all over your clothes, you had a whiteboard marker which seemed extraordinarily innovative. Um, actually, it was just more of the same. It was business as usual. So what we're seeing today, I think, is genuinely the greatest revolution in education that I'm going to see in my lifetime, and many of you, I'm sure, in your lifetimes also. Technology allows genuine innovation. So it increases access for many people, but not for all. So there is still the issue, the genuine issue, I think, of the digital divide, which is an issue that we have to address. And it makes us uncomfortable sometimes to realize that the products and services that companies like mine produce are, by and large, available to the more developed parts of the world, but less so in the developing parts of the world. And that's a challenge, I think, for all of us. Um, but it reminds me of something that Mother Teresa once said when she was looking at the issue of world poverty. She said, well, if you can't feed a hundred people, then feed just one. So in other words, we have to start somewhere. And even if one student 
in the poorer parts of the world benefits from access through MOOCs, for example, through these massive open online courses, then that's wonderful. And I know for a fact that it's a lot more than one. So the, um, we have now the ability today to access education, to access learning materials anywhere, at any time, on any device. So we've increased the reach. Now what that's done, of course, is it, it's thrown up a number of new challenges for educators. We have new skills that people need to learn, they need to acquire to be 21st century employable. And this is a huge problem, the skills gap. At Cisco, we partnered with Intel and with Microsoft to set up something called ATC21S, which I invite you to discover more about. It's based out of the University of Melbourne in Australia. It's the assessment and teaching of 21st century skills. So in other words, it's all very well to teach these new skills in the classroom, collaboration, communication, team building, project work, et cetera, et cetera. But if the assessment instruments don't change, then we have a problem because kids are being assessed still on the old fashioned instruments of measurement. So what we're looking at is with Intel and Microsoft is how do we get around that problem? How can we develop then assessment instruments to measure those new 21st century skills? The role of the teacher, of course, has been transformed since the time when I began teaching. At that time, it was quite nice actually, I was the fountain of all wisdom in the classroom. If I didn't know it, then there was no way that the kids could find out. Today, we can't do that anymore. So instead of being the fountain of all knowledge in the classroom, we become facilitators, we become guides, if you like. Because if you want to find something out now, if a kid wants to find something out now, generally speaking, he doesn't ask the teacher, he Googles it. And Google's a much more powerful instrument for finding things out than going to your teacher. So what's the role of the teacher then? The role of the teacher seems to be redundant, perhaps. Not so. Although Carruthers did say that the teacher is one who makes himself or herself progressively unnecessary. Maybe that's what good teaching is about, actually. So that your learners are not dependent on you forever, but they reach autonomy. They, they become independent learners. So the role of the teacher then comes to a higher level, I think. Instead of being a purveyor of data and information, you reach the, informa the, the, the level of trying to transform that data and information into knowledge, and eventually, we hope, if you're old enough, into wisdom. Um, Professor Agarwal also talked about the flipped classroom. I think that's very interesting. Instead of wasting time in the classroom, going over mere content, which could be covered outside the classroom, the higher level activities such as debate, discussion, argument, disagreement, critical thinking can be done in the classroom. And that's the exciting part of being a teacher. So the teacher is somebody who can inspire, who can motivate. Because we all know as educators that you're gonna get nowhere unless your learners are motivated. Motivation is the number one trigger for learning. Now, as I said, I taught in Rwanda with just a piece of chalk and a blackboard. But those kids I taught 40 years ago were probably the most motivated kids I ever taught in my life. And you can have all the technology you want in the classroom. And I say this as a representative of a technology company. But unless you have inspirational teachers, unless those teachers are trained up, they know how to use the technology, it's a waste of time and it's a waste of money. So, MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. The strength of MOOCs, I think, is that they're massive and they're open, but that's also their weakness, isn't it? They're massive and they're open. So we have issues like how do you accredit them? How do you certify them? We all grew up in a world of something else, perhaps that we might term, term PIFCOs, personalized, immersive, face-to-face -face courses. That's probably what we had our experience of when we were students. I think there's a way though that we can combine those things. At Cisco, we're looking at virtual classrooms through something we call augmented collaboration. Um, again, I invite you to Google that term, augmented collaboration and Cisco, and you'll find out more about it. But the idea is that, you know, it brings the MOOC 
and the personalized immersive experience of the, of the traditional classroom much, much closer together. And I think that's really important. So what does the future hold? Frankly, I don't know. But what I do know is that technology is here to stay. And if, you can, if you've got the resources to be able to invest in that technology, and not everybody does, of course, then I think you have choices to make where you want to be on that curve. You can be an innovator, you can be an early adopter, you can be Kuhn's early majority, or you can be in the late majority, or you can be a laggard. But I truly believe that it's not a case of whether you adopt the technology in education, it's a case of when you adopt it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, finally, we have Mariana Martinez Salgado from OECD. Uh, sh she is an educational policy analyst and member of the Center for Educational Research and Innovation, something we all love. Um, she's been working at the Innovative Learning Environments Project since September 2009. She'll be chatting a little bit about that. And then shortly afterwards, we'll start taking your questions. So start thinking about them now. Take it away. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here. We, uh, we're going to keep it short so we can all go afterwards to those green conveners. Um, well, my colleagues were talking about access and divides and the, these digital divides. And um, I think uh, this is very important. And PISA, PISA testing, OECD PISA testing, found in 2006 that there was a very big access gap uh, related to technology, but PISA 2009, which results were published just uh, um, in 2012, um, came up with two main, ma two main findings. The first one is that the access gap has been dramatically reduced. So in OECD countries and OECD partner countries, this gap has been reduced and only uh, less than 1% of the students in these countries declare not to have any access to technology. But a second divide has emerged, that of youth, how technology is used. Those, student, those students using computers and other devices connected to internet at home had better results on liter digital literacy. This hasn't been proved for other subjects such as math or science, but at least for digital literacy, it has been proved. And the interesting thing about these students is that they are using technology to pursue their own interests. So they Google information, they email things to friends, they chat, they use Facebook, etc. So they are just being curious and creative and just looking for information, and that makes them have better skills. Now, how can we bridge the gap between the use of technology at school, at home, in the museum, in other settings? Well, first, I think we, we need to think beyond the concept of school and to break down those silos of isolated settings in which learning takes place. Because learning can take place anywhere at any time. So we can probably stop thinking of schools and start thinking of learning environments. And if those learning environments are innovative learning environments, even better. And uh, what a learning environment does is that it expands the learning opportunities beyond the physical setting of a school, make, making learning more holistic and relevant to the learner. We said before that those uh, students using technology uh, to pursue their own interests did better in, in digital literacy. And learning, therefore, this proves that learning needs to be exciting, interesting, challenging, and relevant for their own experiences, for their own lives of these learners. Um, and how can today's schools be transformed so as to become environments of teaching and learning that make individuals lifelong learners and prepare them to the 21st century challenges. Well, the ILE project, Innovative Learning Environments Project, where I work, had identified seven principles for learning environments to be 21st century 
effective. These learning environments make learning central, encourage engagement, and are where learners come to understand themselves as learners. Then they also ensure that learning is social. We don't lose this human face-to-face -face interaction and it's open collaborative. They're highly attuned to learners' motivations and the importance of emotions. They have to be motivated. Uh, learning has to be uh, something they enjoy. They're also sensitive to individual differences, including prior knowledge they have. And they are demanding for each learner, but without excessive, or excessive overload. So it's challenging, but it's not stressful. They use assessment consistent with its aims, with strong emphasis on formative assessment. And they finally promote horizontal connectedness across activities and subjects in and out of school. This can be done, of course, through partnerships outside of the school. And all this can, will not happen just by itself. It needs strong design, it needs a structured framework, it needs routines, it needs behind all these a solid learning leadership practice. So now probably the question would be, how could technology ensure all these? Thank you very much. Terrific. Uh, so now is our question and answer period. Uh, before I start taking your questions, we have a series of Twitter questions. I'm only going to ask one of them, um, and then we will take yours, and then I'll start calling on you. Uh, so Juan Lopez Valcaral wrote in saying, how do you see the role of parents evolving in ed tech adoption decisions for schools? The roles of parents being extremely critical lately and discussed in pretty much every panel I've been to today. Uh, and I feel like that would be great for the GEMS perspective uh, from you, Ava. Yeah, <clears throat> I, at GEMS we, we believe the parents role is very important and we have a program Feel Day, uh, which is fantastic and it's uh, a, a way to encourage the parents to talk to share with their kids. And the technology is helping us because we have a, a small tool that we can send uh, to the parents the kind of the question of the day or the things the kids have been doing. So you build a communication that sometimes is missing, either because the parents are too busy, either because the parents, they're a little bit afraid because kids get educated and the parents, they're not at the same level of education. So they don't really know how to engage. They don't really know how to, uh, how do you say that, I have a peer-to-peer, -peer, I may say, discussion. So here the technology, and that's also the, the, the subject of today, how the technology can help. That's definitely creating this collaboration, this link between the parents and the kid, and also by sharing something that is important for the kids that was not maybe so for the parents, using a little bit technology where the kids can teach to their parents how to use an app on a smartphone or how to exchange on, on the net. So there's people walking around with microphones, and when I call on you, please uh, share your name, who you are, and who you're directing your questions to. Uh, well, gentlemen, I'm Dr. R.K. Rai, basically a medical man, and uh, I'm director, center for training in primary leadership of ACI. Uh, I have two questions, one for Mr. Dunstick and uh, another for Maya. See, you're talking about motivation. Is motivation possible without a human element, without a good teacher? Because as the medical theory says, there is a part in the brain, I will not go in detail, which has to be motivated. That we're imparting for top managers is the hard theory. And we are now engaging MBA graduates. Motivations are two. Intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is possible through technology. But intrinsic motivation is never possible through technology. And let me tell you, gentlemen, if a car is there, the car is full of petrol, the driver is on the wheel, but if he does not wheel, the car will not move. So, sir, can you, can this house, or you, both of you, or all four of you, deal with an idea, can project an idea, number one, how to impart intrinsic motivation to our students. 
because once once a child awakened now again in boston last week was participating in a seminar and there were 67 participants i mean the board members were there this has been quoted in journals a question was asked what is one single important factor which helps in motivation and the answer was one self awareness from morning i have been hearing this house i am attending this seminar i wish somebody could have talked about self awareness as a student as a human being unless you are self motivated geared to achieve something to learn something in life to do no amount of technology can really help you right so my question is how can we enhance self awareness the technology the teacher the building the environment or the parts of the garment that we wear who can think of it so the big question here is how to motivate students using technology and education technology and who is responsible for that uh, would you like to jump in uh, thank you very much that's a very um, profound question and a very difficult one to answer actually but i i believe that generally speaking motivation in countries where education is less available less accessible tends to be higher than in those countries where education widely available that's a huge generalization i know and i'm sure that we can all think of exceptions to that rule secondly i think that a very very important driver of motivation is the family the parents the siblings i think they're incredibly important in those first few formative years um a lucky classroom is a classroom where you have motivated students and an inspirational teacher that's great but it doesn't often happen like that you might have motivated students and a lousy teacher so what happens then the kids i suppose gradually lose some of that initial motivation or you might have as is also fairly common the opposite you might have unmotivated kids and a great teacher and that's a big challenge and a big headache for the teacher but i think that progress can be made you know i think that i'm not a defeatist i'm not a pessimist uh you can increase motivation in a number of ways and i think technology is one of them but it's certainly not as um mr farid zakaria said i think it's not a panacea that's for sure it's not a panacea i think the one single biggest driver is probably apart from the family background etc et is the relationship i think between the teacher and the student okay sorry we only have time for one question for this <laughs> one okay Just to start off, uh, I'm a student from Jumeirah College, a gem school, and I and I'd like to note that I fully agree with the impact that technology could have on education, and can have. But I also I believe that in my school that we have been forced to integrate a technology that wasn't organic, and I think that the need to integrate technology in an organic manner is very essential. And and what I, and I liked your quote that if we can, um, if we can't feed a hundred children, we should all, we should feed one. But with the cost of technology in this current day and age i think instead of feeding one child through technology we can feed many more using traditional methods and and one of the main reasons is in developing countries with the lack of foundation that lack of um electronic foundation and telecommunic uh, that foundation in telecommunication the cost rises and the effectivity goes down and moving on to my question but the the principles that we use with technology i personally don't think that we should use the same principles in the developed world as in the developing world so finally my question is shouldn't we wait for these foundations to be laid as africa is developing and there will come a time where these basic foundations are laid and if we don't wait 
Are there any solutions to bypass these technological barriers and economic barriers? Thank you very much. Thanks. That actually sounds like a fabulous question for Prof Professor Agarwal. I don't know if you could hear the question. Sure. Um, happy to take uh, happy to take the question, and I did. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. So, so the question asks, you know, how do we get uh, the infrastructure and the foundation set up? And I think this is a chicken and egg problem. Um, I think uh, we as technologists and educators and innovators could just sit around praying or hoping for rain. But as a minimum, what we can do is create a motivation for rain. So just imagine all the online learning and MOOCs and, and the kind of content that we're producing. Think of that as a huge motivator. Now the data is available, the content is available, the courses. On edX, we have some of the best courses from the best universities and professors. And we are already hearing from governments, from leaders, that say that now that this is available, maybe organizations like the World Bank, nations, need to invest in basic infrastructure that can make these, these pieces of amazing content accessible to students around the world. So as an example, uh, in India, uh, the government has uh, launched uh, this little iPad-like device, um, inexpensive device, it's called uh, Akash. And that's like a little tablet, very low cost, and it's making it available to students. So I think, I think it's a chicken and egg, but I think we need to break the circle somewhere. The way to do it is to make things available, and the governments and the banks and others will follow to create the foundational infrastructure to make that accessible to people around the world. Perfect. Yes, he's sitting down with you. The microphone should make its way over to you. Hi, this is a question for Professor Agarwal. My name is Krishna Gupta. I was actually at MIT 09 in course three and 15. Um, I run a venture capital firm, and I talk to a lot of students around, uh, around MIT and Harvard, and they're already very excited about edX, sort of thinking about building layers of technology on top of edX. So my question is, as that innovation speeds up, how do you iterate back into the actual campus so that the innovation that's happening online, you're able to integrate onto the on-campus experience? Excellent stuff. Excellent question. As I said in my earlier remarks, uh, edX has really two major missions. One is to in expand access to education uh, to students around the world, and uh, my own mission is to try to reach a billion students uh, in the next 10 years. At the same time, our mission also is to reimagine campus education. And I'll give you some numbers. Even though we are uh, less than a year old, we have mo far more courses using edX technology on campuses around the world than offered as MOOCs that you can take on edX.org. Even within MIT, as an example, where, uh, where you graduated, uh, there are over 1,000 students today out of an undergraduate population of 6,000 that are actively accessing the edX technology and platform in their own classrooms. And really, the blended model is where things are going, where we try to combine the best of in-person and online technologies for students. Yes, you right there. Uh, can I finish with my question? Yep, got it. Uh, yeah, my name is Harish and I work with Gems. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, we're saying that this is an online, uh, is it to, it's to Mr. Professor Anand Sleep. Uh, we're saying that this course is, uh, uh, is free and um, want to know maybe after five years of time, what is the thinking behind the uh, companies like edX, Coursera, Khan Academies of the world, uh, whether it's going to be free forever or, or it, it's going to be another business model where they want to make money out of the courses. Uh, what is the thinking behind that? What, what will be the revenue model after, after five years of time from now? It will be, we know how much it costs, you know, to to transfer uh, petabytes of uh, video across the across online. That's, that's the first question. Uh, the second is, uh, how do we replicate this uh, online education pro at the primary level? Is there any other, th is there any thinking um, uh, behind uh, 
you know, to address the same issue for uh, primary or uh, probably pre-primary level. Thank you. I, uh, sure. So, uh, so right now, uh, certainly the courses on edX are all free. Uh, even the certificates uh, that we give at the end of a course, and these are di digitally signed certificates from our partner universities. So these are also free. Now edX is a nonprofit, and so, uh, but we still have to sustain ourselves. You know, we don't certainly don't have to Facebook like, uh, you know, one hundred billion dollar IPO, but we have to sustain ourselves, which is a completely different story. So we have some uh, ideas for a revenue model, and edX is already revenue. And uh, some of these models don't involve uh, charging students. So one model is, I'll give you a couple of models quickly. One model is the courses continue to be free, but maybe we charge for the certificate. Maybe we charge a modest fee uh, for the certificate, and the charge might be on the order of uh, the cost of a textbook, for example. A second example is one where we have begun licensing edX courses within universities. I gave you the San Jose State University example where an edX course was taught in a small model uh, within a university. So we can license those courses to universities. This model is called a SPOC, not a MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, but a SPOC. A SPOC stands for Small Private Online Course, where edX is the small course within the university, and edX gets a license fee. So that's a second model. So there's a number of these revenue models, and many of these models do not involve charging the students. So our hope is to continue offering large numbers of free courses to students around the world, but find ways to sustain ourselves that may not necessarily involve taking away the freedom of access. And, I'm, I'm and I'll try to allow uh, you know, one of my panelists to answer the question about you know, how can this technology help at the primary level? Does anybody want to field that? Leverage, how do you leverage technology at the primary level? Can we'll play it. Yeah. I think that, again, the idea is that at the primary level, what we see is that is the engagement of the kids. You were talking about motivation. Very often, early age, they are very motivated. So they are engaged, and they want to really experience all of the things that they are living around. So in the school, you want to make sure that what they call their social environment and their learning environment is embedded. So you don't want to bring them to school, and they are in the old way, the old brick and mortar. So we will talk, you know, about the blended learning. So a kind of association between the learning. So here you have the teacher can create some content. And you have a lot of content available, you know, today with a lot of small companies. And then the teacher can rework the content and give the content. I think the content itself is available. So you have plenty of content. It's the learning pathway. And I believe that in terms of the young kids, the blended learning, the teacher engaging with them, having these kids, the personalization, this content would be good for these kids. We have seen in some of the schools where you have a committee of the kids, and every month they decide which content they believe is cool and nice to learn with, and they are totally. So yes, it's maybe not lecture, but maybe what we have seen you know, today, the Sasakaria, it would be fantastic to show that to kids some extract, maybe not a one hour uh, video, but few of the video. So that's the kind of example. So it's not yet, I may say, something very academic, but you know what? One of the value of the technology is certainly to bring outside of the totally academic to these young kids because they want to be flexible learner and motivated. Okay, should I? Yeah, of course. If I could add something to that also, I think we had a very good example this morning from the young girl uh, Khadija from Pakistan, who actually attends a regular school, but also accesses MOOCs in her spare time with her brother. Um, it seems to me that people who access MOOCs can be divided into people with extrinsic motivation, so they need to try to get credit, or they need to get a better job, or something like that. They need to upskill, and those with maybe intrinsic motivation, internal motivation, people who, are, who, who just want to study something because they love it. Um, I think there's a real fantastic opportunity for everybody, irrespective of age, whether you're a primary school kid or whether you're a retiree, to go online and get access to these MOOCs now. 
and just explore the world of learning. Great. So I think we have time for about two more um, questions. I know I we have, have the gala question. tonight. Uh, the gentleman right in the front. Yeah, thank you Hello. very much um, for a very exciting panel. My name is Professor Mohamed Dukha. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Gambia. The first question is for Professor Agawa. I'm very much excited and fascinated with what you're doing down in Boston. We in the continent of Africa running universities have serious problems. And one of the problems is the aging of our faculty and the attrition of highly capable faculty from the developing world to the developed world, leaving our campuses very empty. Most often we have courses that it is very difficult to find a terminally qualified faculty member to teach these courses. Thus what you are doing brings a huge opportunity for African universities. Um, I'm glad to hear that there is licensing model, but I was wondering what can we do, for example, the University of the Gambia with MIT edX in a partnership where we really disrupt the way we deliver some of these courses that we find it very difficult to find the faculty. And we are grooming the capable undergraduates to be tutors and the master's students to be tutors. So in other words, we run your courses as credit, and then we have these instructors facilitate tutoring during lectures. I think if we are able to sit around the table with vice chancellors from the continent of Africa, this would be quite, quite extraordinary. And I would like to engage you on your insights on how do we go about to, to do that. The second question, um, I've been listening for some of the panels and there are two areas within the continuum of, of, of education. We've talked a lot about teaching and learning, primary and secondary and perhaps higher education. But there's not much discussion on the early childhood development, which is quite a very important aspect in the learning co continuum. So I would, I would like to hear your insights on that. The other aspect is not much is being conveyed to us or discussed on performance and assessment. Uh, there is not any discussion on the disruptiveness of examinations, which is a very important component of primary and secondary education, which still remains to be in the classical form, O levels and A levels, and in, 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 in the continent of Africa, for example, the students will take an exam and will have to wait uh, for weeks or for months when technology brings certain opportunities. So I was wondering what kinds of insights in terms of disrupting using technology, the way we assess and examine to move away from a pass or a fail or an A, where sort of assessment is more like the physician. When you go to the physician, you know, I mean, there is different checks that are done and then you are assessed and what is needed is given to you to improve. So the motivation level of examination begins to shift. So I'm wondering what your insights are in terms of using technology, moving from learning and teaching to the examination aspect of it, where now technology brings an opportunity. Finally, the other question is to Cisco. Um, I listened to you attentively when you, when you discussed the pricing model and the cost of hardware for folks in the developing world, for example, Africa. I think the, the economics are such that perhaps the pricing models of hardware, now is the time to revisit it so that it could be pegged at affordable rates to harness technology further so that pricing will not be a barrier. In the old model forms of content, textbooks, for example, you have pricing for the developed world and pricing for the developing world. Um, perhaps that's a very naive analogy, but I'm thinking that if we push the envelope, and this is where the future is going, I think hardware providers must revisit their pricing models. And I was wondering, what is Cisco doing to ensure that price of a device in a poor environment is costed in a way 
that is compatible to their economics. Thank you, Bahid. Thanks. Those are three powerful questions for sure. Um, I would definitely recommend chatting with Professor Agarwal uh, afterwards to discuss licensing and the future plans. But I would also love to hear uh, Mariana talk about the assessment um, yeah. that we mentioned. Um, well, you, you're right. Assessment is uh, is very very important because otherwise we 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 can't know if the learning is taking place and if it's effective or not. And um, and then there's another. It, there's a big challenge uh, about assessment, and is that most of the countries need to um, have national curriculum and national testing. So how do you put into action some alternative ways of assessment when you have to, uh, when your uh, students here need to pass that national test? So in, in our project, we have, um, I, I just rem uh, remember two uh, interesting examples one is a school in Alberta that is, um, it's, a, it's a learning um, community. So it's not only a school, also other people from the community come and take courses, etc. And they have their own assessment, um, testing, very different, very formative, face-to-face. -face. The students, they, they put their benchmark they, uh, they work with the teachers face to face all along the year. There's no written test or anything. But then at the end of the, um, the grade, they still have to take the national test. So, or the provincial test in this case. So they prepare them for that test, but uh, they have created their own way of uh, formative assessment. And the second one is uh, in Peru in a network of schools that are now in pilot phase, but are going to replicate this model. Um, it's Innova Schools, if you're interested in that. And they are using technology to assess. They have, mm, sometimes the students, the learners use computers individually to learn. And sometimes they, they learn more collaboratively. And sometimes, well, they have different types of learning. And when they're using technology, technology, when they're using tablets or computers, that they have this program that tells the teacher what, which student is doing well, which student is repeating the same exercise and may need help, so that the teacher can just go and see that specific student and talk to him, see what's the problem. And so you have both assessments, the automatic one that technology can provide and the more formative one that you put in place. Great, thanks. Um, and Kevin has final thoughts here about the Cisco grant. Very briefly, yes, thank you for the question about how can Cisco um, enable um, countries with limited resources to access the same sort of tech that we have in the more developed countries. Um, first of all, we do believe that the appropriate and effective use of technology actually lowers costs. So it lowers your OPEX over time. I mean, we have case studies that can, can back that up. Um, whether it's in teaching and learning, whether it's in administration, whether it's in uh, physical security or cyber security. So in all of those areas, we believe that there are um, cost efficiencies to be made over time. So the issue really then, I think, is about the capex, the cost of implementation in the beginning. And we have a branch of our, of our company called Cisco Capital that deals exactly with that issue. And so these are people who will customize a solution for customers. Um, I don't want to sound too much like a salesman, so I'm going to stop now. <laughs> but do, do feel free to talk with me afterwards if you, if you wish to. Any final note? Yeah, I, I would like to add something on assessment. You know, there is two kinds of assessment. There is at the end, we pass or even pass, which before technology was at the end of the year. So maybe you miss one year with the kids. Now, with the gaming development technology, we've seen a lot of, of the software we've seen in education to learn language, for instance. This gaming technology allows you to have uh, ongoing assessment. You, know, you go to this level, to this level, to this level, there's algorithm within the software. So versus your question, is technology is, use, is helping for assessment? A good software of education will assess every second the kid will avoid him to go to three level if he doesn't need to go because he already understand and needs to go to the other. 
and then the teacher will be able to see beforehand he's going to fail at the end of the year and maybe to save his year because he knows after one month that he didn't understand this. And here, technology is a wonderful online and offline. It's available largely on some good software. This gaming development technology is very, very powerful for ongoing assessment. Okay, uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. So thank you everybody for your wonderful Anyone? questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the, the kill from them. <laughs> yeah. One more question. One more question. Is he still there? Yeah. Pro yeah. Professor, are well, you there? I'm still here. I, he is, yeah. I can ask a question. Yeah, I'm here. No, okay, do you, if you want to wait, I can hear. You have a minute here. It's just been quite frustrating because this has been a largely evidence-free discussion, not really recognizing the fact that MOOCs are not really new. There's been large-scale online teaching and learning going on for decades already with the advent of um, open universities the world over. You will have heard from Martin Bean earlier on today. At the Open University in the UK, they were running um, 10,000, 12,000 student trial courses, and that's true of many of these open universities. And unless we learn the lessons from all of that work, um, all of those teachers who were already in many parts of the world in schools and universities have been doing this kind of experimentation, then it won't move forward. Because, for example, one of the things we know is that you, if you ask students to help each other in online discussions, they find that very difficult. That takes a lot of very careful orchestration and nurturing by the teacher. So even in those massive online courses that we've had already, it has been very difficult to get beyond the one to 25 staff student ratio. And none of the ones that we've seen coming up so far have really achieved that. What we see, and I think what people have been talking about, is where we have very well qualified professionals helping each other. And of course, in that context, that works well. But if we're serious about trying to provide the, the answer to the global requirements for higher education for so many millions of students all over the world, for undergraduate higher education, that takes the kind of nurturing of the individual that requires very different kinds of pedagogies, which MOOCs are not getting close to. And even Harvard, when it, it launched its, uh, its law school um, degree uh, MOOC recently, was limiting it to 500 students because they only had 20 teachers. That's a 1 to 25 ratio. So what it's very important to acknowledge is that teachers are themselves innovators. That huge workforce throughout the world of teachers who are themselves innovating, if only they got the chance, they would innovate much more with, with technology. We must recognize that and allow them and support them in discovering what those new pedagogies are that enable us to get beyond that 1 to 25 ratio. Otherwise, it's just a cruel myth that we can hope to help those poorer people in poorer countries ever to get the kind of ed education that we're really talking about here. Recognize the teachers. And by the way, Martin Bean, the Vice Chancellor of Open University, was one, uh, uh, one of the panel, and he <laughs> definitely explained well, I'm sure you would have said many of the same things, but, but it's the teachers who are the vehicle to making this education system work. Absolutely. Uh, I'd love to get Professor Agarwal's response to the question. <laughs> sure. Uh, so thank you. Uh, you know, th thank you for uh, the question. Um, I would. Uh, I think our experience has been a little different. Um, first of all, in these MOOC courses, the strength of the peer-to-peer -peer interaction is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, it it completely boggles the mind. Where you know we see students from Pakistan, New Zealand, Colombia, India, U.S., U.K., helping each other on the panel and learning by teaching. And uh, I really believe that uh, for a large number of types of courses. Uh, they're learning extraordinarily well. And I would fit a student that has earned a certificate of mastery from one of these edX MOOC courses against an online, a student who learned it online all day long. We offered a blended class at MIT for the circuits course as an example with 20 students. And we also had a uh, class. And uh, the students that uh, passed each of these courses, I would fit them against one another all day long. So I'm, I'm not at all convinced that, uh, or rather I'm convinced that MOOCs work for a large number of courses. To your point about the 1 to 25 student ratio, so edX, uh, let, me, let me add to that. So edX has introduced a new technology on its platform. It's very innovative. It's called cohort. So the discussions have a large number of students. 
However, what we do is we enable the professor to create small group cohorts. In the Greek history course that launched a couple of days ago, uh, Professor Naj from Harvard is creating cohorts of 1,000 students each. So we can do that on the edX platform. In the copyright course, the professor created cohorts of 25 students, and he had a uh, human being, a TA, serve as a moderator for those cohorts. Now, that's an experimental course. And one technology we are trying to experiment with is where you ask students from around the courses, including those who've taken the course before, to sign up as a community TA. So now you can imagine having 1,000 or 10,000 cohorts, each of 25 uh, students, and then you get community TAs to sign up as moderators for each of these smaller forums. And so I, I really do believe that you can really get people from, use crowdsourcing, if you will, and get people to help, uh, you know, help each other and thereby expand the access uh, uh, to MOOCs. Uh, one final thought to uh, the Vice Chancellor from Gambia. Um, I would encourage you to send me an email. Uh, we would be very interested and delighted uh, to work with you in trying out a model where we can work with Africa in, an, in a university in Africa uh, to help things out. So please send me an email. Thank you. That's great. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. And thank you, everybody, for coming. It's been a great discussion.